Rank wide Jeff Patterson is at UBC, our Canucks reporter reporting. How are you, my friend? Yeah, doing well. Canucks skating and uh, jumping the jet, heading to Edmonton and off on this five-game road trip. So getting in a little skate here this morning and away they go. Our first chance to talk to you since the Car- Connor Garland trade request. Jeff, what do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, the timing was uh, far from ideal, certainly, and he didn't want to play ball when we had the chance to talk to him on Tuesday. Uh, it looked like a guy that uh, wanted to play and play hard and open the scoring on Wednesday night, obviously, but uh, then didn't play an awful lot in that hockey game. Uh, you know, there's always moving parts here. You don't know all the factors, and again, we tried to pin Garland down about uh, uh, you know the truth and the accuracy of this and the reasons behind it. And again, he didn't want to talk about it. Kept talking about how his focus was on the game. And all I could think was, that's fine. But like, it's not easy to change agents the night before a season. Like, you can tell me you're focused, you're laser focused on the Oilers. But clearly some thought went into finding a new agent, the right agent, uh, making all of that happen. So, you know, again, hard to sort of take him at face value when he's trying to tell us that nothing to see here. I think there is something to see here. And we know that the Canucks have been trying to shop him for a while. If this is now him saying, fine, like, uh, I do want out, um, you know, we'll see if the pastures are greener elsewhere. But uh, in terms of opportunities, I mean, hard to beat getting a chance to skate alongside Elias Pettersson and Andre Kuzmenko on the top line for the Vancouver Canucks. So, uh, you know, if he truly wants out, I, I think the best thing for him would just to maximize this opportunity to play with Pettersson and see if that can't lubricate things. Yeah. But ultimately, the, the contract remains an issue here. And if the Canucks have to retain, you know, there's a couple of things that come to mind. Fine, if they want to consummate a trade and move Connor Garland out, they have to replace him. Somebody's got to take that spot in the lineup. That person's going to have a contract as well. And if you're retaining money, like it's not as simple as moving Garland out and just replacing him with Vasily Colson because they're not as good a hockey team uh, in the here and now. And this is supposed to be a team that wants to pick up where it left off the other night and use that as a springboard to a big season. So, again, lots of moving parts here. We know for the better part of a year they've been trying to move them with no takers. If they're willing to retain now, uh, perhaps that facilitates it. But ultimately, uh, there are other shoes to drop in terms of filling that spot in the lineup. And uh, how does that impla- impact the, the salary cap? Yeah, very well put, Jeff. I mean, maybe Garland was just finishing his summer business with the agent. Then he turned laser focus on the season. You're absolutely right about the winger depth and how to replace him. We're asking on the Bodog poll question, Garland with 1.5 million retained for Dante Fabro. Would you do that? And would you target a defense or would you target a replacement if you have to move him? Yeah, I mean, Fabro is interesting, a local guy, obviously, and we know that Nashville has a bunch of uh, defensemen, certainly. Uh, but again, it's not like Dontre Fabro comes here for free. He's got a contract and uh, there's a price point involved there. So making it all make work and make sense. Uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, certainly for the Canucks, they'd have to figure all of that out. They've been certainly looking to beef up the back end. So I think it makes sense on that level if they can get a player that they think they could plug and play, but it does weaken them up front. And again, Connor Garland, you know, goes these long stretches between goals. And that's sort of been my issue with him in his time as a Canuck. You can't question his hustle and his effort and his determination and everything else, but he's making 5 million bucks. You can't score on opening night and then go 15 or 20 games without the next one. And we've seen that uh, too often from him in his two years as a member of the Vancouver Canucks. So, uh, I, I'm looking forward, as long as he's here and he's in the lineup, you know, how does he build off what he accomplished on opening night? I know he didn't play a lot in the third period, so his ice time was diminished there. But, uh, no, I, I think if you're the Canucks and in a perfect world you could move this player, uh, I think it makes perfect sense that you would try to target uh, the defense and, and try to continue to chip away at rebuilding uh, that as they have here through the offseason. I, I would be way more in favor of the Canucks uh, trading for a player, let's let's say like a Dante Fabro, but then rather than retaining salary, take on a bad contract that Nashville has that might ex, uh, that might expire before these three years are up with Connor Garland because, of course, they've got to start accommodating for those big years of OEL dead cap hits coming right. up down the road. To me, that seems like a, a better claim. Although That's the problem with retention. Yeah, yeah. I, I look at the, the Nashville setup and there's really nobody that I think they would be that would fit that category. But, you know, if you find somebody in that in that space, that might be better to take on. You know, take your lumps here in year one. Uh, for the savings that you might get here in your two and three on that on that contract, but of course, 
Um, easier said than done in today's uh, trade market. Uh, let's get the load on what you saw at practice today. And that is, I, I was surprised that Thatcher Demko was there. I thought they'd just give him another day to get right. But there he is on the ice. And, and I don't know that he got put through the the paces necessarily because they had the practice goalie as well, Jeff. But were you surprised just to see the whites of his eyes? Yeah, without knowing what kind of recovery day he had yesterday. Come on, they gave him 12 minutes off there on Wednesday night. He should be fine <laughs> and ready to go. Uh, but yeah, without having had the benefit of talking to him, I, I think like I hear where you're going, Blake. And if there was any reason to think that you know he was still really fighting the flu bug, then yeah, give him another day off and get a morning skate in in Edmonton. And it's a you know eight o'clock local time plus whatever opening ceremonies they have uh, ahead of the Oilers home opener. So it's going to be a late start there. You know, just not much more time for him to rest and recover. But we had heard this in the offseason, and I think this is great. Uh, first practice after the win, they had Thursday off, and they've got a practice goalie on the ice. And, you know, even if that means Demko faces, you know, fewer reps in practice, it just it makes sense that you're going to use this guy, you're going to lean on him an awful lot. Why not reduce the wear and tear on your uh, stud goaltender early in the season? So uh, the practice goalie was out early facing shots with Ilya Mikheyev and Carson Soucy before practice and then joined the group. And it was interesting because Demko was out with the practice goalie. And I thought, wow, they got a practice goalie, but there's no Casey to Smith. But to Smith was one of the last guys on the ice. So, yes, two, the two regular goaltenders plus uh, the third goaltender out there. And I just think that makes perfect sense. And again, these are, you know, little small incremental items, but in the big picture over 82 games, I think it can all add up that, you know, it was the right call to get Demko out the other night. If he wasn't feeling well, there was no reason uh, to stick with him. Same thing with Garland. You know, Quinn Hughes plays under 22 minutes the other night. Uh, again, I, I like that. In the third period, you don't need Quinn Hughes logging big minutes and then here at the first practice since their win. They've got a practice goaltender on the ice reducing the workload and sort of uh, some load management uh, in the early going here this season. So it's good to see that the organization is true to its word, that this was something that they had floated during the offseason. And I just think it makes perfect sense to uh, reduce whatever you can in the way of workload for Thatcher Demko, who is likely to be really busy here out of the game i understand carson Susi looks pretty good out there today jeff yeah i mean it's been one week since that final preseason game against the calgary flames when he wrenched his knee got tangled up with jaeger sharon govich and we knew that he had been skating but this is the first time that i'd had the chance to see him uh, was out early as i said with mikhaev and he was being put through his paces by the skills coach and didn't appear to be holding back uh, you know skating laps and uh, looked pretty mobile, and I thought maybe that was going to be it for him. Maybe that was his workout for the day, but uh, then he and McKay have both stayed out in non-contact jerseys and were full participants in practice. Now, the Canucks uh, only have six healthy defensemen right now. Susie's an extra body at this stage, so uh, in terms of you know his readiness for game action, I'd be surprised wearing a non-contact jersey day, the day before a game if he's ready to play in the rematch against the Oilers, but he certainly looks like a guy that is going to be traveling with this team out on a five-game road trip, and I would think that you'll see him here uh, in the next week at some point. But we'll get an update uh, from the head coach and get a little better indication. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the way that he got tangled up last week, and then they said week to week, you know, I was prepared to buy into that. It looked like it had the potential to be a fairly significant knee injury, and so this is uh, it represents a ton of progress for Carson Soucy to be back uh, with his group at a practice here uh, one week later. 12 forwards, dare to dream. Uh, that's kind of nice, although it means no Ted Bluger uh, because uh, Jack Stanika is there, and it looks like they'll probably have to use this uh, this free player uh, under the uh, under the rules of the National Hockey League. No cap hit for Jack Stanika, but uh, at least they get the full amount of skaters, it looks like. Yeah, which will make life uh, easier for the coaching staff. Won't have to uh, you know, try to figure out who's going to go out over the boards next when you're down to 11 forwards. And Dakota Joshua got in that early fight. And so for a while there, they were down to 10 forwards. And we know Garland left in the third. So there were a ton of moving parts on Wednesday night. Stadika on a line with Sam Lafferty in the middle and Niels Hoaglander in practice. So I think that is your fourth line heading into Edmonton on Saturday night. I was a little curious. Uh, whether Lafferty would stay in the middle. He did not have a particularly good night in the faceoff circle, uh, struggled there mightily on the penalty kill as well. I mean, there were some nice signs from Sam Lafferty, but uh, I think the minute Teddy Bluger is back, he'll be the center on that line and Lafferty will slide out to the wing. But uh, in the absence of Teddy Bluger, and it's funny, and not funny in the sense that it's uh, humorous, but when both Bluger and Susie got injured last Friday night, 
you know, to the eye, Susie looked like the guy that was in more distress and Bluger suffered what was a pretty standard, you know, block a shot, uh, bruised foot, shake it off and you'll be okay for opening night. And then obviously he wasn't in the lineup then and not in practice here. So uh, this has turned out to be more than a week for Teddy Bluger and uh, no sign of him at all before the practice and certainly not with the group. So don't know about his availability here moving forward. Is he going to have to catch up with the team somewhere out on the road trip? But uh, in the absence of Teddy Bluger, uh, yeah, Sam Lafferty's going to stick around as the center on that line. I thought maybe Stadika might slide to the middle, and it's possible if Lafferty continues to struggle with faceoffs that Stadika could get an opportunity. But Jack Stadika very much living day to day as an emergency recall in the National Hockey League right now. And we talked about it, guys, with that little spread out games on the road. It's actually that's a good thing for Ted Bluger for uh, for them trying to get Susie back too. Is that um, even if it takes a couple of extra days, that might only mean you know, one game that they miss. Yeah. And that's when that schedule came out and you thought, okay, they start at home and then boy, out on the road for five, they always have these early road trips, but this one is a little different. Usually when you go out on a five game, there's a back to back in there somewhere just to tighten it up, to compress the travel and everything else. But here there are days off between all of these games. And in fact, after Saturday in Edmonton, they don't play until Tuesday now uh, in Philadelphia in that game that's been bumped up an hour. So a three o'clock, Pacific time puck drop due to baseball and the fact that uh, the parking lot uh, in and around Wells Fargo and the, I mean, one of the great North American sporting destinations is that whole area in Philadelphia with the football, baseball and, and hockey rinks uh, sharing parking lots. So uh, they go Tuesday, they go on, uh, they go Saturday in Edmonton, they go Tuesday in Philadelphia and then days off uh, the rest of the way. And so, yeah, you know, if it's Thatcher Demko and he's going to play all of them, uh, that certainly will help with his workload and his rest. And then for the injured guys, you're right. Uh, they're not playing three and four right off the hop here uh, you know, to start the road trip. Dan Murphy joining us here on Sakarison Price alongside Jeff Patterson or behind Jeff Patterson, as the case may be, from UBC. We had talked about it on Rick White on Wednesday, Jeff. And Rick Tockett um, said in the postgame Wednesday, that he was likely going to have to split up Hughes and Hronick because he doesn't have last change. And yet there they were practicing together today. So what do you think? Is the head coach throwing Edmonton a little bit of a curveball there? Or are they just going to go back to Hughes and Hronick? How do you see that meeting out tomorrow? Yeah, I, my hunch is that they'll start the game that way. But ultimately, Jay Woodcroft has last change and has the luxury of uh, attacking the Canucks defense with Dreisaitl and McDavid or splitting those two up and forcing the Canucks to try to counterbalance there. So a eh, little bit of a cat and mouse game, a little bit of chess uh, early on in this season, but I think they really liked what they saw. Uh, I do think the one luxury that Rick Talkin has here right now is that Philip Ronick has been outstanding through the preseason and again the other night. And if he has to hold down and you know be the, uh, the anchor, if you will, on uh, a pairing on his own, I, I think he has shown that uh, he's off to a really nice start here. Uh, the thing that we have talked, though, repeatedly about that is we still have never seen Quinn Hughes and Ian Cole uh, through camp, through the preseason. And if you move away from Hughes and Veronik, I would assume that Ian Cole is probably the guy that's going to get the opportunity to skate with Quinn Hughes. So uh, if you're going to experiment by fire in-game against the Edmonton Oilers, that doesn't seem like the ideal time to see if you could forge some chemistry there. So... I think they liked an awful lot of what Hughes and Hronick and they were out a lot with Miller and his line against McDavid and, you know, pretty much threw a blanket over him, forced him to defend, spent more the night in his own zone than he's used to and than he likes to do. And I kind of feel the Canucks are going to go with the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of thing. But again, the Oilers have last change. They're going to be motivated. Uh, hard to believe that McDavid and Drysaddle at even strength could be any quieter than they were on Wednesday night. So I think the Canucks have to be ready for the Oilers really to come out at them and show that what happened on Wednesday isn't going to happen very often throughout the season. Yeah, it, it ain't broke mm -hmm. now, but uh, that's yeah. a team that can break things. No, I so. know. Uh, Cole <laughs> and Hughes may be the white whale here, uh, yeah. Jeff. And uh, for those listening on podcast, Dan Murphy was on the camera shot. Yes, mugging behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, marvelous stuff, Jeff. Thank you for this. We'll catch up on Monday. All right. Sounds good, guys. Rank quiet tomorrow, Blake and Jeff after the Oilers and Canucks. This is a Carson Price clip brought to you by Bodog. Make a play at Canada's Choice for free casino games, sports odds, and poker strategies.